she wasn't the only woman. Ruth wasn't the only woman in that lineage of Judah. But was she like this because she was because she was in that lineage and was in was in that that um, branch of the tree for Christ to come through that line of David, uh, Jesse and Obed and Boaz and so forth, or? was when God was looking for a line to bring his son through that he looked at Ruth and her her commitment and I mean you don't know it's it's it's, it's, it's uh, it almost gives you well it does and it should give you moments to think and just a, it's a great story and I appreciate you sharing that with us um, I had a flashback this week of something I'd almost forgotten about and it was from the early 70s uh, which in some ways doesn't seem like it should have been that long ago, but then um, it has been quite a few days. There was, uh, and, and on MSN of all places, um, you know, you how you, I don't know how, what your homepage is for your, for your internet or whatever, but anytime I log on to the internet, um, especially on my office computer, which I've been there this week helping them with the auction and stuff, but um, on MSN, you know, it's got those pictures that scroll by of the leading stories of the moment or whatever, and then all of a sudden this picture pops up, and it's this big wooden gate with Oz on it, and I thought, and it brought back a memory just like that from childhood, because back in the early 70s, I think it opened in 1971, up at Beach Mountain, there was an amusement park called the Land of Oz, and I guess it's still there because somebody had been there this photographer had been there and taken pictures of it, and he goes around the country taking pictures of um, stuff similar to that. Um, but it's still there; they still let tourists in at certain times of the year. But it's not a, it's not a it's not an amusement park anymore. But my sister went on a my sister that's three plus years older than me went on a field trip there. And probably she was in the fifth grade or something like that, um, fourth or fifth grade. And she came home telling stories about it. And I don't know if that's what led, because I remember it was me, my two older siblings, not, not that sister. I don't remember her being there, but it was uh, my brother Steve and his either wife or soon-to-be wife, and I think they were already married, I'm not sure, um, and my older sister Nancy, and maybe one of Linda's sisters, Linda, my brother's first wife, was there too. I can't remember, but I know it was me, you, and Steve, Nancy, Linda, maybe one of Linda's sisters, and Ma Flossie. Uh, because we've got a picture of her sitting, and she sat down, and once we got inside the gate, there was a little auditorium, or a little outdoor theater or something there, and she sat down and said, I'm going to have to sit here a while while y'all go do your little thing. But there it was, Land of Oz. And you know, it, it, it gave me, and we still, if we go through all those pictures you have at your house, there's a few pictures in there of, of the day that we spent at the Land of Oz. And I, my, again, my sister went on that field trip and came home telling the stories, and I'm this little kid going, you know, thinking, wow, because she's talking about going in this house, and it's like you're in there when, the, when the, the tornado comes, and you look out the windows and there's stuff flying, and you come out and the house is upside down upon the witch, you see her feet sticking out from under the, you know, and for little kids, you know, that's, man. So maybe... You know, me being a, a whiner <laughs> or something is what got got that made mom take that trip up to Beach Mountain in the Land of Oz, or maybe they just wanted to see it too. But there was 44,000 bricks, it says, 44,000 yellow bricks. And this guy had some really good pictures, and it was kind of eerie because the fog was rolling in, and, you know, he was there in an early morning or something and up on the mountain, and, you know, the fog's coming in, and you see this abandoned yellow brick road, you know, and... And I remember, I remember the Yellow Brick Road, I remember some of the rides and attractions up there, even though that's been a hundred years ago. But, you know, I thought about that, and I thought about it, and I sit there and looked at these pictures of this Yellow Brick Road, and not to, not to fantasize our walk and our, but you know, we, we come in here each Sabbath, just like we did last Sabbath, and Kyle got up here, and Chris, and they are instructing us, you know, Kyle talking about the, the tearing down of other people's work, and you know, the thing that he went through there, and then Chris got up and, and gave his message. And we're, we're sitting here listening to, each week, we're listening to instruction in, in Christian living. Not only what does the Bible say, and how do we translate it, and what does it mean, and getting different, getting different thoughts and processes, but we hear about 
how to conduct ourselves and what we're supposed to do as Christians and the way we're supposed to walk, the how-tos, the how-tos of walking the course. Now, we take everything that we hear, whether it's from me or, or Kyle or Cody or Chris or whoever happens to be up here, and we make our own assessment of, of you know, what do we do with that and how do we apply it. And there was an opening prayer today that says, open our ears to what we hear and let it be helpful to us, and that's what we hope that we do here each week. We don't have to, you know, you don't have to take everything I say lock, stock, and barrel, but hopefully you take something good from what all of us say and, and are able to apply that in some way um, on your walking this course, the how-tos, these interactions that we have with other people and how we conduct ourselves in the world. And, you know, there's always that, too. We're trying to learn that balance between, or we're trying to learn and be instructed between balance and burnout because we don't, you know, we've we've... We've seen both. Uh, we've seen people who've had balance, and we see people who burn out. And then we also we have to learn how to process our environment and, and, you know, what does this mean and what does that mean and where are we and that kind of stuff. It's interesting to me. I get amused sometimes that God leaves things for us to figure out. You know, he just does. He doesn't just, you know, plug us in and there we go. He leaves us things to figure out on our own. Gives us a portion of his Holy Spirit, yes. He absolutely does that. He gives us a portion of his Holy Spirit. He tells us he does that at baptism. You know, we're given a we're given a, a, a an earnest of his Holy Spirit, and we're to flex that and help it to grow and nourish it and all those kinds of things. But he tells us that he does and will reveal things to us, doesn't he? You're going to take this Holy Spirit and you're going to, you're going to nourish it and you're going to, you know, help it to grow. And I'm going to reveal things to you. He tells us that he will do that. But it's not a free download, is it? It's not just, like again, it's not the, you know, we don't have a flip top head or we don't have a disc that we can plug in and all of a sudden there's all of God's plan. It's clear and in focus and we're, we're on our way and we can't, det- can't be deterred from our path because it's, we're, we're programmed. Well, we're not programmed. He gives us a program to strengthen and to work on it's like the ultimate treasure hunt isn't it you know we have this goal in mind and sometimes we see it clearly and sometimes we don't depending on how bogged down we get in this in this world i do know or i do believe that we are supposed to be curious we're supposed to be inquiring and no doubt in my mind that that's one of the meanings behind his lest you be like these children, comments and statements that he makes in his word. Unless you be like these little children, you're going to have no part. You're not going to be able to inherit the kingdom of God because you just don't have the right attitude. You don't have the right, you know, you just don't have it. Uh, You don't have the right heart. There's no doubt that that's the meaning, at least one of the meanings behind that. It's the attitude of a child, the heart of a child, and never losing your sense of wonder. Never losing your sense of wonder. And we do that. We get... Older, crustier, cynics, and we do. We, we, we get to these places in our life where we're kind of ebbing and we're just going through the motions, but we're not really enthusiastic. We're not really, we don't have that sense of wonder. We're not amazed. We're not, you know, we get, especially in an election cycle, maybe we get, you know, out of heart. And, and man, this place, this, you know, this world is terrible. Um, you know, but one of the things I think about when I say, lest you be, like these little children, I think about families, and I think about influence. You know, it's no wonder to me that a lot of times you see families, and especially if they're a close-knit family, and the kids grow up in this family, and they're, they're exposed to the things that the parents do, and the things the parents believe, and the, the lifestyles, and all that different stuff. So there is families, there is influence, whether it's whether it's sports teams, whether it's politics, whether it's, um, you know, religious views, professions, the things that we do. You know, some people are, you know, you hear people that are fourth, fifth, and sixth generation firemen or fourth and fifth and sixth generation policemen or, you know, people whose great-grandfather, father, or great-grandfather, grandfather, father, uncles, all this was in the military. And it's, you know, they've all been Marines or they've all been in the Army. They've all been in some branch of military. Same thing with some of the females. You know, there's not that all families pull for all the same sports teams and that kind of stuff, but there's that influence there. That's what I'm trying to say. And if you're brought up in a conservative household, 
depending on whether you want to rebel and because my family, but that's influence, isn't it? Because my whole family, I've all, all my life I've been conservative, I'm going to go, you know, support something else. I'm going to be way over here and be liberal or vice versa. I've always been growing up a liberal. I've always grown up a liberal, so, you know, I'm going to try out some conservatism or whatever. But it's still influence. It's still the influences that make you... I want to read, and this Bible is a little intimidating, um, but I, I have to get it out every once in a while because I don't know if you, any of you have a have a uh, parallel Bible, but the thing I like about it is when you think about different translations, just like when Cody was reading those uh, scriptures in in Ruth and and in Proverbs. If you have a if you have a parallel Bible like this, you've got your passage of scripture, and then you've got three more versions of that same scripture on, right in front of you without even turning the page. So when you turn the page, it's the next passage, and then three more. This one happens to be the New Revised Standard Version, and then you have the Revised English, the New American, and the New Jerusalem Bible. So right here on, in front of you, you have four different translations. So if you look at all four of those, and sometimes there's some things that's quite a bit different, and some of them read just about the same, but just so you know, the scriptures, and I don't have a lot of them today, but the scriptures I'll be reading will be coming um, probably more from the New Jerusalem Bible, which, and I don't know what version you had, Cody, but it, the, the New Jerusalem Bible was the closest thing to what you were reading, or the version you were reading. I don't know if it was King James or the what? Yeah. Because I was looking at all four of those translations as you were reading, and I, and I kept going back to this New Jerusalem as being the closest thing um, to what you were reading. Uh, I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 2 for just a second. Way down in, in Luke chapter 2, the only thing about this Bible is it doesn't have tabs or anything, so it takes me just a minute to... And because there's four translations of each passage on each page... It's easy to turn past or not turn far enough. But Luke chapter 2, I'm going to be reading in verse 46. And I was saying the thing about families and influence and, and, and you know, kind of the things that um, make us who we are, our early influence, our early, you know, when we're very susceptible to influence and developing our opinions. But in Luke chapter 2, verse 46, Luke chapter 2 and verse 46, and again, this is from the New Jerusalem Translation, the New Jerusalem Bible, it happened that three days later they found him in the temple sitting, and we know right away what this story is. You know, it says they go up to each year to, to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover, and then when they, when they leave, they've traveled, you know, Joseph and Mary have traveled a ways before they realize that their son's not with them, so they go kind of in haste looking for him, and it happened, it says in verse 46 in Luke chapter 2, three days later, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his intelligence and his replies. They were overcome when they saw him, and his mother said to him, My child, why have you done this to us? See how worried your father and I have been looking for you? He replied, Why were you looking for me? <laughs> why were, well, maybe because you're our son, and we went three days out before we realized you weren't with us. But why were you looking for me? Do you not know that I must be in my father's house? but they did not understand what he meant. You know, this is a cause, isn't it? Why do you look for me? You, you had to know that I must, must, I'm bound to be in my father's house. That's, that's what I'm here for, basically. Now, he's only, he's only a child now, and we've always said there's this gap between what we read about Jesus here and what, you know, it says he began his ministry about the age of 30. So there's quite a bit of time, 18 years in between here and, you know, by the time he begins his ministry. But this is a cause. You know, when I say families have influence, he is of the family of God, right? He is the only begotten of God. How do you, why do you look for me? That's, that's my influence. That's, you know, that's where I'm going to be. That's the cause. Being in a cause. And then if you go over to Luke chapter 12. Even at that age, that's what he's standing for. That's what he's doing. That's his cause. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 41, and we'll know as soon as we start reading here, I'm, I'm skipping over some of the scriptures, but it says in verse 41 of Luke chapter 12, P. 
Peter asked, or Peter said, Lord, do you mean this parable for us? Do you mean this parable for us only or for everybody? And he replied, Who then is the wise and trustworthy steward whom the master will place over his household? Again, him and his father's cause, way back there when they found him in the temple with the, the teachers, right? And his father had turned over his household. But when he turns over his household to give them at the proper time their allowance of food, Blessed that servant if his master's arrival finds him doing exactly that. I tell you truly, he will put him in charge of everything that he owns. But if the servant says to himself, my master is taking his time, <clears throat> my master is taking his time coming and sets about beating the man's servants and the servant's girls and eating and drinking and getting drunk, his master will come on a day he does not expect. And at an hour he does not know, the master will cut him off and send him to the same fate as the unfaithful. You know, but, but my... My primary reason for reading that scripture is he's talking about what is given to us, what's expected of us, and bless that servant if his master's arrival finds him doing exactly what he's been instructed, following the example. So we know that it's a, it's a sprint, right? It's not a, it's not a sprint, it's, it's, a, it's a marathon. We're, we're always to be about, even if we get in those little ebbs where we, you know, we get a little crusty and a little cynic and you know, maybe just going through the motions, but we do have to find those things that help us get back into the, get back into the groove and, and, and be excited and have that curiosity and be uh, inquiring and have that sense of wonder. Um, because we know that it's, it's, it can be a, a long path. That, that, that brick road that we're following, um, 44,000 bricks. You know, if you lay those bricks one at a time, you know, they didn't just go up there <clears throat> on Beach Mountain back in 1970 and take a dump truck and start going and all those bricks just go and make that yellow brick road did they that's one brick at a time <coughs> excuse me so it's not a sprint you know and I've seen some and I know you have we could all we all got examples of those we've seen some pretty quick burning fuses people that people that come in running and they're on fire they think and they're just oh that's they're after everything they can find and they're devouring it and that's and that's most people actually when you know, we all came in that way to an extent, but then we've seen those people come and we it's like, and I've given you the story, um, and if we still had the dog, it would probably happen today. We had this little wiener dog. Her name was Belle, and I remember it plainly, and the kids used to get a big kick out of it because every Sabbath when we would come home from church, or any time we came home after we'd been away for a little bit, but I remember it plainly on the Sabbath because we'd get home in the middle of the day, she'd been in the house, you know, I could go at the back door, and just start scratching on the door. Not I'm from the outside. She'd be with me waiting to go outside, and she'd be wagging, and, and I'd start scratching. What's out there? What's out there? And, oh, she would just be getting wound up. You could just see her. You know, she's getting so much stuff built up, she couldn't stand it. Because one of the things that she ran outdoors looking for were cats. She loved to chase cats out of the yard. If there happened to be some stray cat or neighbor's cats, or, and it was the funniest thing. I wished I had it on video. I got her worked up one day, and I, she couldn't wait for me to open the door. And there was forever, until I repainted the steps, there was claw marks down the steps where when she opened that door, it's like, Shoo! But she would, and it was plain as day, there was a cat, a stray cat, neighbor's cat, sitting in the backyard. Here goes Belle. <laughs> and leaves and grass flying up behind her. She's going through the yard, runs straight past the cat, doesn't even see it. She's got so worked up, and she takes off through the yard, doesn't even see the cat, and the cat just sits there and watches it go by. Like... <laughs> but it was it was the funniest thing, and I think sometimes in God's church we do that. We see these fired up people coming through, and we, all we have to do is just sit there sometimes and watch them pass through, and they're gone. You know, they don't they don't stop. They're not built. They're they're throwing down the whole road at one time. They're on the they're in the express lane, and they they get, we see people do that, brethren. I don't mean it's not a, it's not it's sad. It's not really a joke, but we're, that's what I mean when I, we've all seen some pretty fast-burning fuses. Have you ever been lighting firecrackers and you get that one? You know, you've got it timed. You know, you know how to light a firecracker. And all of a sudden you get one and the fuse has got gasoline or something on it because you light it. You, go, <laughs> you, you can barely get rid of it before it blows your fingers off. But, yeah, it happens. It happens. I know that we have to be curious, and I know that we have to have inquiring minds, and we, we need to learn the kind of stuff that we've been hearing today and, and reprocess it 
and make it mean something to us again so that we can, men and women, men and women can learn a lot from that story that we just heard. And that's, that's part, of my, it's part of my point. Curious and inquiring, but tempered with a little bit of caution. Because the scripture does tell us not to get carried away with every wind of doctrine and running after everything that we hear. And what, what, that's not just from a spiritual standpoint. That's in the world. Look at all the stuff that we're hearing now if you turn on the TV. All this political stuff. You don't know what to believe. You don't know what's real and what isn't. You don't know what anybody's doing or what they really think they're going to do. You just have to be a little calm and steadfast and just see where it all goes. Um, Curious and inquiring, but with a little bit of caution, not carried away. Will there be setbacks? Yes, there will. It's easy to think. It's easy to think it would be simpler if it was an automatic download, or if if he was more specific, if he was more hands-on, if he was more involved on, with us every day, walking us down the path every day that we get up. He comes and sits down with us and says, "This is what I want you to do today." And this is how I want you to treat this situation, and this is how I want you to treat this situation, and this is what you need to do when you're thinking about this decision. You know, do you, okay, you're thinking about should you take this job or should you not? Here's what you need to do. Da 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 da. We think it would be easier, right? If there was, if God was that hands-on and God was that specific, and we didn't have to pray and wonder and ask and ask and ask and ask and ask, what does He want me to do? How do I hear that voice? How do I know? How do I know what's the right thing for me to do? We think it would be easier if he were more specific and hands-on. It worked for Peter, right? <laughs> it was a cakewalk. He had him right there. Could ask him anything he wanted to. Made it, made it easy, didn't it? No. Peter still denied him, you know, when he was arrested. He still sunk after walking out on the water. He still couldn't, couldn't get all of his meaning when he was telling him something, even, even on the beach when he asked him three times, do you love me? Of course I do. I mean, I think he finally did, but you know what I mean. After the burning bush, after the burning bush incident, is it okay to say, I mean, I think we are, that Moses was about the father's business? He didn't want to do it, did he? Why, why me? I can't speak. I'm this and I'm that. Um, but he did it. I think it's safe to say that he was about the father's business, doing what he was meant to do. But... One of the things that you think about reading the story is there can be setbacks even with specifics too, can't there? Um, you think about the water at Meribah. People were murmuring again. Imagine that. They were thirsting to death. And again, you've brought us out here, we're going to die in the wilderness versus we'd just be soon be back there making bricks and working for Pharaoh and being slaves is to be out here and just, you know, die in the wilderness. Just thirsting to death. And God said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go up here to this rock. I want you to call you and Aaron. I want you to call the congregation together. I want you to speak to this rock, and the water's going to come forth. Right? As flesh and blood human beings have a tendency to do, he had to get a little bit dramatic, didn't he? Couldn't just go up there and speak to the rock. That wasn't, I don't know what I was going through. Moses' mind won't even pretend to know. We know what the consequences were. Moses got up there and he did as God said. He called the people together, him and Aaron. And what did he say? Must we fetch? You know, you people, here you go again. You know, how much stuff have you seen? How many miracles have you seen? But yet the first little trial comes and you're ready to go back to Egypt. Must we fetch water from this rock? Now, is that what he was told to do? Must we fetch water or God said to me speak to this rock speak to the rock here comes the water and everybody's you know everything's good God was specific go to this rock speak to the rock water will come forth the lesson in that is if you get specifics if God speaks to you if he does sit down on the side of your bed when you wake up tomorrow and says here it is you know, then if, if he gives you specifics, you should be prepared to act specifically. That's, that's the drawback, kind of, sort of. Because um, I know reading that story, too, many times, it tells us that 
the Lord said, or the word of the Lord came to Moses, and it came to Moses and Aaron. And often, when it was something bad, when he was saying something, I'm going to, I'm just, I've had it. I'm just going to, I'm going to squash these people. Oftentimes when that happened, it would be Moses or Aaron or both begging for a reprieve. Oh, God, please don't do that. Be on their knees, on their face, God, please don't do that. And, and one time they were talking about, what's it going to look like to Pharaoh if, you, if we lead all these people out of Egypt and then we come out here and then you, can't, you can't keep them alive? They all die. What kind, of, what kind of message does that send about the God that we serve? But there was always, most always, there was a, 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 a beg for a pardon or a reprieval or a reprieve. And I can't imagine, I can't imagine all those years with these murmuring people and, oh, wait. It has been a lot of years with murmuring people. Just kidding. But those experiences, could you imagine all the experiences? Just the ones that are recorded are, are you know, more than we can imagine. But we don't know what all Moses and Aaron and all that situation and the experiences that he had. But, we, as I said, we, knew, we know the consequences of him not following those specific instructions at the waters of Meribah. And he was eventually told, Moses, you will not be the one to lead these people into the promised land. Now you can imagine everything that Moses had been through. He didn't want to do it, number one. All of that mess in Egypt with Pharaoh. I'm going to let you go? No, I'm not. I'm going to let you go? No, I'm not. I'm going to let you go? No, I'm not. Years of that. And then, all of that trip, once, he, once, they, once they do get let out, and you're leading them through the wilderness... God's leading. Moses is, you know, there as, a, as the lead figure, human figure. And then, after all that, I'm sorry, Moses, you're not, you know, you, you couldn't follow instructions. You're not going to be the one. can't imagine what a sobering moment. But I also don't remember, and I didn't look it up. Maybe you can correct me. I don't know that there was ever a plea once Moses was told you're not going to be the one. I don't know that there was ever a plea. Please let me be the one. You know, he didn't, he didn't get on his knees and, and beg for that to be lifted. You know? But because you did this and that, you're not going to be the one. And it was not long after that, just a few verses in that same chapter, I believe, that he was asked to appear on, with Aaron on Mount Horeb. And, you know, you're going to strip, you're going to strip Aaron down. You're going to put his clothes on Eliezer or Eliezer, whatever, it, whatever you want to call him, but and Aaron didn't come down. He was gathered up, wasn't he? And that's Moses' brother, and he's been with him all this time. You're not going to be the one. You're going to go up on top of this mountain with Aaron and Aaron's son. You're going to strip him down. You're going to put his clothes on his son. And you're going to leave Aaron there. He's, he's, he's going he's to be gathered up not gathered up, but he's going to die there. We may think sometimes, brethren, as Moses likely had to, this course that we're walking, and, and when we get into certain situations, I know sometimes we think we've messed it up. Sometimes we, we can think we've, you know, we've messed it up. And if God wasn't so big, that may be true. You know, it's not always cool to be about the Father's business. Christ didn't care. Even at 12 years old, you know, he's in the temple asking questions and giving some pretty profound answers, and everybody's astonished. And why do you come looking for me? Um, don't you know I'm bound to be about my father's business or bound to be in my father's house? And it's not always cool today, especially, to be about your father's business, to do the things that we know that we need to do. And as we slide down this slope, and brethren, we're on a slope. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, and we've been here before. You know, Mary and I were having a conversation on the way down here about history and different things and, you know, the comments that have been made about Donald Trump and comparing him to Adolf Hitler and, I mean, who knows? You know, who knows? I, I, don't, I don't know any of that stuff and it doesn't really matter because I know who's in charge. It does matter, but it doesn't. But, and I was telling her about the book I'm reading, 1861, which actually I haven't got to 1861 yet, it's still 1860. But Abraham Lincoln is president-elect. If you had been in this nation in 1860, you would have thought, I would have thought, I can't put thoughts in your mind, but if I'd lived on this continent in, 
in the United States in 1860, I would have thought this is the end of, this is, this has got to be close to the end. There was so much hatred and vitriol in this country. I mean, people were, I mean, we see the, we see the riots at the rallies and see people getting punched in the face and stuff, and we think, man, the world's just going on a, we've been there before. There was a lot of people that thought Abraham Lincoln was the Antichrist, <laughs> for lack of a better term. You know, it's, and I told Mary, it's funny how history looks back on a president versus where he started. There was lots of, and that's what this book, it, and the reason I'm reading it is because it's, it's supposed to be a, it's supposed to be a well-written, um, very authentic portrait of where our nation was leading up to the Civil War. It's not about the Civil War. It's about our nation leading up to the Civil War and how we got there. It's, so far, I've only read two or three chapters, and it's a lot of stuff I didn't know. They're long chapters, but, um, and it is a well-written book. I've, I'm enjoying it so far. I just don't get to read in it as much as I, but we, my point is, we can look at the political landscape today and see all the stuff that's going on, and so many wedges, so many wedges dividing people, so many things polarizing people. There's always the race thing. Now there's this political thing. That we watch the thing. And anytime Brian brings up something from CBS Sunday morning, I guess he, you know, since I've mentioned it so many times, he figures I'm seeing it too. But I don't know if you saw it last week, the, the segment on the gun, the gun thing, the handguns. And there's, you got people over, there's hardly anybody in the middle. Either there's people over here that think handguns are the, the, the devil. Nobody should have a handgun. And then, just like we passed up here on 40 today, up at Hickory at the, at the, show up there, there's a gun show, and they've had to put in a parking deck up there because cars were parked in the trees if they, could, if they could have got their vehicle up there. But, you know, there's a gun show up there this weekend, a gun and knife show, and it's wall to wall. So there's people that think everybody's got to have a gun, and there's people over here that think nobody should have a gun. There's all these different things in the world that's driving wedges. There's very few things that I can point out in our society that are bringing people together. You know, John Kasich has said the most common sense thing of any politician I've heard in this whole political season. And it's not that he's the first one that said it or he's not the only one that said it, but if we could all see that we're Americans first, we're people. We're all people on this same planet. Before we're Democrats or Republicans or whatever, we're, we're all in the same country together. But we don't operate that way. We're always trying to find the most divisive issues. But again, my point is we've been here before. Now, one of these times is going to be the last time. But they were very divided in 1860. This was a scary place to be. But as we slide down this slope, it gets more and more rare to be cool about being in the Father's house or being in the Father's business. The last scripture I'm going to share with you is Mark 15. And I don't mean to be on a soapbox up here, brethren, but there's just a lot of things in the world that get us off, get us off the, the game plan and, or has a tendency to. You know, there's people that say, hey, Donald Trump, you know, people could say, you know, Barack Obama was Antichrist, but he doesn't fit the he doesn't fit the description. You know, it talks about being raised in the lap of luxury and da 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 da. Well, who knows? We shall see if we live long enough. But Mark chapter fifteen, verse forty two. Mark fifteen, verse forty two. It was now evening, and I say this, and I, this scripture came to mind when I said it's it's it gets more and more rare to be cool. But it says, and it was now evening. And since it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, there came Joseph of Arimathea. And more important than that is his position. He is counsel to the priesthood. He's a prominent member of the council who himself, what? lived in hope of seeing the kingdom of God. Joseph of Arimathea, 
prominent member of the council who himself lived in the, it lived in the hope of seeing the kingdom of God, and he boldly went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate, astonished that he should have died so soon, summoned the centurion and inquired if he, if he had been dead for some time. Having been assured for this by the centurion, he granted the corpse to Joseph, who brought a shroud, or who bought a shroud, took Jesus down from the cross, wrapped him in the shroud, and laid him in the tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock. And then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary of Magdala, or Mary, Mary the Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of, of Joseph, took note of where he was laid. It wasn't cool. It wasn't cool for Joseph of Arimathea in his position to do what he did. But he did it. Because it says he went boldly. There came Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who lived in the hope of seeing the kingdom of God and boldly, with courage went to see Pilate to ask the body of Jesus Christ. Because what? He lived in the hope of seeing the kingdom of God. This man has been crucified. He's dead. I want to, I want to give him a proper burial. I want his body to be taken care of in our tradition. And that's what he did. There's going to come a time, and it's getting there already, and, and it's going to get worse. When it's not going to be all that popular for us to be doing what we're doing or to be in things that are about God's business. Those that wait upon the Lord, does the scripture say you win? If you, if you live in the hope of seeing the kingdom of God, do you win? Or can somebody take that away from you? Or is that a prize that is there for your taking? Are you off to see the wizard? Are you off to see the kingdom? Are you laying one yellow brick at a time? I mean, I don't mean to make this some little joke about some little fairy tale that was written long ago and became a popular story in a movie. Do you win? In the words of Ronald Dart, for all of his ministry, you were born to win. Born to win. To stand for the cause, do you win? Or is it a losing proposition? Brick by brick by brick. Before you know it, there's a path. There's celebrations and there's setbacks. We all know that. We've all been there. Sometimes we're looking for heart. Sometimes we need just a little more heart. Sometimes we're just looking for courage. I have to have the courage to do what I know is the right thing to do. And we always need brains. We can't ever leave our brain anywhere. And we're all brethren certainly trying to get home nothing like childhood curiosity there's nothing like childhood wonder and adventure you are an eventual winner brethren and I hope this is just another guidepost in those, of de in, in those endeavors of Christian living